Hello, welcome to History 322U, Modern East Asia from 1800 to the present. The arrangement that I use for this fully online course is to assemble weekly PowerPoint presentations, which I put into D2L and which I will try to send to you by email, accompanied by links to YouTube audio uploads. What you see on the YouTube picture right now is just a piece of cloth over the camera, so you don't have to look up my nose as I do this lecture into my laptop. I found over time, trying different alternatives, that this is less expensive and more reliable than uh, other methods. Let's go on to slide two and talk a little bit about how this course is run. I'm especially interested in making sure that you can write, if, uh, write, write better anyway than, than you do now if you are entering into this course and you are less than a crackerjack writer. Um, and I'm interested in helping you separate the wheat from the chaff in your viewing about Asia, whether it's watching something on CNN or Fox, or whether you're looking at an offbeat movie made in South Korea. I want you to be able to view what you see more critically. I don't do grade, grading on the curve. This is all about points. Um, I'm not cheap in the points. But I don't just give them away either. You have to do work to get the points in this course. Um, so make sure that you do that work. We'll get into that a little bit in a little bit more detail later. Uh, of course, all work must be your own. Uh, if you don't know how to do footnotes, then you will learn how to do footnotes in this course, or unfortunately, you will lose a lot of points. Learn how to do footnotes. It's really not that hard. I'm always willing to assist discuss it over the phone or, or show you things in emails, but I'm going to make it very easy for you to do this properly in this course if you pay attention and if you try. Pay attention to the online requirements. If you've not taken an online course before, that is pay attention to the on-time requirements. If you've not taken an online course before, I am required, according to the way the system is set up, to assign due dates and times for assignments. For example, the weekly discussions which are required in this course and make up 20% of the grade are due every Friday at 7 p.m. So the first one is due Friday the 4th of October at 7 p.m. That uh, time I picked because that's when the library closes and I would not want you to be doing stuff on this course late at night on a Friday or, God forbid, on a Saturday night. You have to have a life as well as uh, do the work in this course. And indeed, I wish to point out that you can have a life and do well in all your courses if only you treat school as if it were a job. 40 hours a week at least. Make it 50 and do well. Um, that stuff is pretty easy, and all you really have to do is get yourself up in the morning and go, go, go all day long. Then you can have the uh, much of the evening off. I won't dwell on that. On these discussions, you treat them sort of like it's a discussion section in a live course. And what I want you to do is to show all of us, as you post your discussion for the week, 250 words worth of discussion, that you understand some part of the readings. I don't need you to summarize all of the readings. God forbid that would take too long and it would take up too much space. I just want you to show that you understand part of the readings, just like you were speaking up in a section. And there'll be instructions for each uh, discussion in that regard. All of our textbooks are at the PSU bookstore right now. Um, some of them are available from other local bookstores or on the web. Um, and just a word about the Fukuzawa autobiography. It's a great book. I've made it optional because uh, um, I don't want to require too, too much reading in this course. But it's a great book. It's easy to read. 
um, you can read it for fun. Uh, I recommend, by the way, when doing all your readings and when viewing videos and when listening to these lectures that you take notes. Okay, let's go on to slide three. I've covered some of this already. Um, it's important uh, to understand, um, I think, the historical foundations of this um, of, of, East, of, of East Asia um, today, where people are coming from, what they think of themselves, uh, what they think of their perceived antagonists. Um, and it's very important to understand how colonialism rose and fell in East Asia during this period of 1800 to the present, uh, and why the United States um, remains an Asian power uh, as it became during and after World War II, um, and the changing role of Australia. Uh, often ignored in this country, the role of Australia has become more and more important as time has gone on. As well, I hope to uh, sharpen your critical abilities as we discussed already. Um, news coverage of Asia is often shallow with premature conclusions. Um, it's important that you be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, that you be able to absorb large numbers of facts and produce concise and cogent summaries of them, uh, as well as show critical thinking. These are important skills on the job market. You can't get along without them nowadays. And I would feel remiss in my duties if I were not trying to assist you to be more competitive in the job market as well as, as, well as learning the materials of this course. And I'm one of those people who has not been an academic for very long. I'm 57 years old, but I've spent my whole career up until this year in government and business. Therefore, I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about what a hiring manager looks for. So I have tried my best to orient much of this course to meet the goals of standing out when you are interviewing uh, for a job and when you are uh, competing with others to uh, obtain employment, to attain and maintain employment. One additional point before we go on. Um, well, we can get, we can go on to slide four. Um, it's extremely important that you do not miss any assignments. It breaks my heart when I am grading and I see somebody who's done lots of good work, but they missed one of the papers that was worth 20 points, or they've done a reasonable amount of good work, but they've missed half the discussions, and that's 10 points. That's more than one grade difference. Somebody who should be a B student gets a C minus. Somebody who should have gotten an A minus gets a C plus or a B minus. That's ridiculous. Don't fall into that trap. Uh, these, these assignments are all very clear. The deadlines are all very solid and concrete. Um, don't blow it. Get these things done on time. Um, I've already told you I don't on the curve, it's all about points, etc., etc. Always take notes. I think I already said that. Take notes on everything. Whether you're watching one of the movies that's assigned, or you're doing the readings, or you are listening to lecture. If you need some tips on how to do these things, uh, there are people in the university who do that for a living at the writing center and so forth. I cannot, by the way, underline more vividly that the Writing Center, which is in the same building as the History Department, the Writing Center is on the first floor of Kramer, they are outstanding in assisting people with writing problems. They can also help with um, study habits. And I'm happy to discuss methods of study, methods of taking notes uh, on readings or lectures, this sort of thing with you if you uh, contact me. Let's go on to slide, past slide five, into slide six. We'll talk about, we'll start to talk about the material of the course now. The geographical, demographic, and economic realities that impact Asia. Let's start by trying to get a better understanding of the United States. 
where we are now. Australia, which will figure prominently in this course because of how its importance has grown, at least in the second half of the course it will. Um, Australia has been called the lucky country with, um, in some parts of it anyway, good weather, uh, geographic isolation from potential enemies, um, and other advantages. But they have nothing, and indeed no country on this planet has anything on the United States. Please make sure you read the, uh, the selection that is, is part of this week's reading assignments about the United States and its uh, geographical position in the world, because it's very important for your general education that you understand this. The United States is the gold standard when it comes to geographic and demographic advantages. You can see on this map, on slide six, the dark areas, which are uh, concentrations of agricultural wealth. Uh, you can see, of course, that we in the United States have two open coastlines that have no obstacles that could be used by a foreign power to um, you know, no island chains off the coast that could be used as ways to bottle up uh, shipping in and out. Uh, it's easy to, to uh, leave the United States in a naval vessel and go any direction uh, away from the coast. This is a very important strategic advantage that the United States has. There are more seaports enabling global outreach. There are more navigable rivers inland. Um, per square mile. There are fewer people per square mile than in all other major countries. Um, the United States has therefore developed a very rapid and uh, lethal ability to reach out with and project military power. No country has all the advantages that are listed on this slide. No other country. And immigration has been very important. Immigrants have historically been an economic advantage, and they still are. People still come to the United States if they can. Let's go on to slide seven. So what does this mean? Um, the Americans have no hindrance to expand overseas. We'll shortly contrast that with uh, China, Japan, and other countries. Um, to prevent invasion, the Americans, uh, after the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, eventually assembled a substantial navy in the 19th and 20th centuries to prevent invasion. Now the Americans can reach to any corner of the world and control the oceans there. They, the US Navy cannot control all the oceans at once, but they can go anywhere they want and control the oceans there in more than one place at a time. Um, there is a de facto empire of sorts that has um, developed, not in name, um, and not strictly in the historical sense, but in some uh, factual ways. There is a de facto, in other words, uh, empire that has developed with the United States. So we, the Americans, are advantaged. Not specially chosen people by God or any of that sort of stuff. I would not. Uh, hazard to make that assertion. We hear about that all the time during elections. We hear about it in the movies. Um, but in practical ways, we have become exceptional. It's because we have this uh, rich and strong uh, country that has developed partly out of geographical advantage um, that has allowed us to project power anywhere in ways that other countries simply cannot match. Going on to slide eight. The United States also has the world's biggest economy uh, stemming from that geographical advantage. This combination of factors um, makes America an Asian power and very relevant to the events described in this course as we will discuss in future weeks. I won't read all these bullets to you. They're pretty obvious and you can read them on your own. Feel free to stop the recording, etc., as you see fit. Going on to slide nine. Finally, there are additional elements of American advantage. 
um, that cement the country's position in the world, and I would argue uh, make likely its continued superior position for the coming decades. Um, America's position is not perfect, but it's relatively secure in comparison with other large nations. Of special importance is the so-called Five Eyes relationship. That's five, as in one, two, three, four, five, five eyes. That relationship has enabled the U.S. and its allies, uh, namely the U.S., the U.K., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is the closest and possibly, well, certainly the most powerful alliance in the world. Um, and it has played a role in making the United States an Asian power um, with uh, a close ally, Australia, in the region. It's enhanced the U.S. ability, in other words, to operate in Asia and influence events. We'll discuss how Australia became important uh, to modern Asian history in the post-World War II era in future weeks. Let's go on to slide 10. So if we contrast this situation with most of Asia, um, it's uh, it's notable, it's remarkable, the uh, disadvantage that every country in Asia has in relation to the United States. Um, many countries face problems from competing ethno-linguistic groups, uh, other rest of minorities, especially on their borderlands, and so on, as you see in this slide. The, um, the uh, inset figure there in the bottom right of the slide shows, for example, a place where I used to do a lot of work um, doing uh, corporate investigations. Uh, I've motored all around this region, and uh, it's a region of very high tensions, uh, where Muslim people who are in Thailand, who are a minority, um, are treated very badly by the Buddhist majority in Thailand. and. And this is a uh, bone of contention between Thailand and Malaysia, which is a Muslim country, a majority Muslim country, uh, where um, the, uh, the uh, major party, which is um, constructed along religious lines, has uh, ruled Malaysia for decades. And it's a Muslim party. Um, so the US has, um, by contrast, managed to integrate and absorb most of its ethno-linguistic groups after a few generations. Its immigrants uh, almost inevitably, inevitably become um, uh, Americanized. Australia has done the same thing. Um, it attracts immigrants. You've seen a lot in the news media, possibly, about the boat people who are turned away by the Australians, but they have a much larger uh, legal immigration system where they absorb uh, tens of thousands of people every year. Um, and they do it because they want to do it, because they need immigrants, just like the United States can use immigrants. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of argument that we need immigrants in the coming generations in order to maintain the social security system. Um, but that's uh, another topic for another day. The United States does not have a perfect immigration system. There's a lot of debate about uh, uh, what should be done with it, about who should be let in, and so on. Um, but we simply need to make note of this historical reality that the U.S. Is, uh, and Australia are both long practiced at absorbing immigrants, and they've used this absorption to their advantage. Um, all over Asia, by contrast, again, you find these competing ethno-linguistic groups which hate each other's guts. There's really no soft, fuzzy way to state it. Um, these are ethnic rivalries that make our ethnic rivalries in the United States look like nothing. Uh, the, it's far more murderous, to be blunt, in Asia, the situation between ethnic uh, groups than you'll find in North America or in Australia or even in Europe. We'll continue. Um, I have to stop here because these YouTube recordings are not reliable after about 20 minutes. So I, what I do is I make 20-minute recordings, 
and then I post them as you'll see. So uh, we'll stop here and go on to slide 11.